You've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. There will be suffering in this life. We certainly wish that we could avoid suffering and pain altogether. But Paul tells us here at the end of this verse that God allows us that we could be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. In this life, persecution, tribulations, and trials, it's kind of like a refiner's fire. God uses those trials to purify us. He takes away the dross. He humbles us. He makes us more prepared for glory. There's a common misconception amongst some people, new and old believers alike, that following Jesus should equate to a carefree life. They expect financial, social, and emotional stability to follow conversion. But Jesus isn't saving us from earthly troubles and hardship. He's saving us from enslavement to sin and selfishness. As Pastor Ron will explain in today's message, this journey with Christ will not be easy or free of suffering, but Christ will carry you through it and provide peace through the storm. Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 with today's edition of Larger Than Life. Here we are, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 12. Uh, there is an ancient story told about a servant who traveled with his master to Baghdad. And as he walked the busy streets, he found himself in the marketplace where he saw death in human form. Death looked at him with such a piercing look that he was frightened and believed that death was planning on taking his life. In light of that, he quickly rushed back to his master and told him that he had seen death in the marketplace and asked if he could ride his camel to Samaria about 15 hours away. He was certain that death would not be able to find him there. And so the master gave him permission and quickly the servant went on his way. A few hours later, the master was in the marketplace where he also saw death in human form. And he walked up to death and he asked, why did you look at my servant with such a threatening look? Death answered, that was not a threatening look. It was a look of surprise. I was astonished to see him in Baghdad, for I have an appointment with him tonight in Samaria. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we all have an appointment in Samaria. There's coming a time where we will pass from this life. We've shared it with you before. The statistics on death are pretty amazing. 10 out of 10 of us will die. And so it's important that we talk about death. And yet so many people see it as maybe morbid, morose. Definitely it's uncomfortable. However, John Tillotson had some great words. He said this, He who provides for this life but does not care for the life after death is wise for a moment but a fool forever. How true. So we need to talk about death, life after death. What happens? Is there a heaven? Is there a hell? A study put out by the Barna Research Group stated that 81% of Americans believe in an afterlife, but only 39% believe in a literal hell. I thought that was kind of interesting. So 81% believe in heaven because that's where most people think they're going no matter how they live, but no one wants to think about the alternative of actual hell, so they just kind of try and block it out of their minds. And yet another poll stated that Americans agree that heaven exists and that God still performs miracles. But they're not so sure about the reality of hell. Uh, in a U.S. News and World Report, it said, quote, hell used to be pictured as a literal place of fiery torment, outer darkness, and weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, that's what the Bible says. <laughs> However, modern political correctness says that hell is kind of benign, embarrassing, and even cartoonish. That's true. And here's the sad thing is that ha that has crept into the church of America so that people don't want to teach about hell. They ignore it altogether because it has kind of a negative connotation, right? I think of Rob Bell. I don't know if you know who he is. Rob Bell was a pastor of a very large church in America, written quite a few books, but his last book that came out several years ago was entitled Love Wins. And in this book, he essentially whitewashed hell altogether and basically said, it doesn't matter how you live, what you do, we're all essentially going to heaven. Um, by the way, Rob Bell is no longer a pastor, and he spends his time, you know, coming up with all kinds of quirky doctrines and writes blogs, but he's far from the truth and, in my estimation, far from God. I do love what C.S. Lewis wrote. Now, these are good words, and I agree with C.S. Lewis. He said this, There is no doctrine which I would more willingly remove from Christianity than the doctrine of hell if it lay in my power. 
but it has the so full support of Scripture and especially our Lord's own words, end quote. Hey, I wish that hell didn't exist, but it does. It's in God's Word, and Jesus talked about it. In fact, Jesus talked about it more than anyone else. But here's the point. He never did so with joy. In fact, in Luke chapter 19 and verse 41, we read Jesus talking about coming judgment. And as he's doing so, it tells us he wept. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus took no pleasure in talking about hell. But he talked about hell because he wanted to keep as many of his people from going there as possible. As Paul talks about the realities of Christ's return and how it will affect us throughout all eternity in verses 5 through 12. Now, there are three main truths we've given you an outline we're going to look at this morning. First of all, we'll look at hell. We'll look at the righteous judgment of God. And then we're going to look at heaven. We're going to look at the rewards of the believer. And then very briefly, we'll look at the relentless prayer of Paul. But first of all, we're going to be talking about judgment. Now, again, just to remind you, we began this letter last time. We just looked at the first four verses, and Paul was encouraging this church that was persecuted. And do you remember what he praised them for? He praised them for their increasing faith, their abounding love, and their uh, patient endurance. I mean, in all of that, in all their difficulty. He says at the end of verse 4 that they were experiencing persecution, tribulation. And now he continues that thought and says in verse 5, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you would be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you suffer. So he establishes the fact again that there will be suffering in this life. We certainly wish that we could avoid suffering and pain altogether. But Paul tells us here at the end of this verse that God allows us that we could be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. In this life, persecution, tribulations, and trials, it's kind of like a refiner's fire. God uses those trials to purify us. He takes away the dross. He humbles us. He makes us more prepared for glory. Nowhere in Scripture are we told that we're going to be immune to persecution. In fact, quite the opposite. In uh, John 16, Jesus said, In the world, you're going to have tribulation. Yay! Remember in Matthew 5, 12, he said, blessed are you, not if, but when you're persecuted. So it's going to come. 2 Timothy 3, 12 says, yes, if you want to live godly in Christ, you will. It's a promise. Deal with persecution. So we shouldn't be surprised by that. And, and I think for the most part, certainly you as part of our church, you're mature. You understand that trials are part of the Christian experience. So let me talk about just another little issue, if you don't mind, for a moment. I think we understand that. That's easy to understand. But I think what happens is, or what boggles our minds often as Christians, is when we're going through difficulty, but it appears that the world isn't going through difficulty. As Christians, we're the ones persecuted, but it seems like the wicked are always, you know, having the better time, you know, kind of a thing. Did you know that the psalmist believed that? Psalm 73 is dedicated to that very thought. Uh, let me read to you some of the verses from Psalm 73. In verse 2, the psalmist writes, My feet almost stumbled, and my, my steps nearly slipped. I almost stumbled in my walk with the Lord. Why? Because I was envious when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Their strength is firm. They're not plagued like other men. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than their heart can wish. They scoff wickedly. They speak loftily in front of God. Their mouth is set against the heavens. They're always at ease. Their riches increase. And surely then I've cleansed my heart in vain. So Lord, I'm just messing it up. Why am I serving you? Look at it. It seems like the wicked have it all together. So this is what he writes for 16 verses. Then the psalmist gets to verse 17 and says this. I was envious of the wicked until... I went into the sanctuary of God, and I understood their end. Surely their feet are in slippery places, and they will fall into destruction. So, you know, sometimes we think, it's not fair, I'm going through this. But wait a second. One of these days, judgment. That's the idea, is judgment. I, I was reading about two farmers, and one was a believer, the other was an atheist, Harvest season came, and the atheist was taunting the believer because God had apparently blessed, you know, the atheist more than the believer. 
The atheist family wasn't experiencing any sickness. Their fields were rich with harvest. That year they were going to make a lot of money. And so he taunted the Christians saying, I thought you said it paid to believe in Jesus. To which the Christians said, it does pay. But it doesn't always pay out in September. In other words, it doesn't always happen in the harvest time in this earth. But there is coming a time. Our reward is in heaven. And so Paul says in verse 5, remain steadfast in your difficulty. And when you do, it's the manifest evident of the righteous judgment of God that you be counted worthy of the kingdom of God which you suffer. That term worthy means to be deemed right. Our steadfast persecution in the midst of difficulty is a, it's an affirmation of our faith in Jesus Christ. It's the validity of our faith when you remain true, trusting God in the difficulty. It's an evidence of saving faith. He adds in verse 6, moving on, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. So he says, remain steadfast. Don't worry about the ungodly. I will deal with them. I will deal with those who trouble you. There's a great verse in Zechariah chapter 2 and verse 8. God says this, speaking to us as Christians, he who touches you touches the apple of my eye. Now, in ancient terminology, the apple of the eye is the cornea or even the pupil. And what God is saying is, when someone touches my kids, it's like poking me in the eye. God doesn't like that, just so you know that. So God essentially says, I'll deal with that, but let me do it. Jesus talked about this in Matthew 18, 6. He said, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble or fall. And by the way, he's not talking about little children. He's talking about people that place their faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus says, those who cause my children to fall, it would be better that a millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the depth of the sea. So God will judge those who come against his people and who reject him. The truth of the matter is, 2 Corinthians 5.10 says this, everyone is going to stand before God. One translation of that verse puts it this way. Quote, sooner or later, we're all going to have to face God regardless of our conditions. We'll be appear before Christ and take what's coming to us as a result of our actions. It's no light thing to know that one day we'll stand in a place of judgment. That's why we work urgently with everyone we meet to get them ready to face God, end quote. Are you ready to face God? If you're not, I want you to know you could today. Did you know that you could actually be ready to face God, to meet God, and not be fearful, but be glad? Well, in contrast to judgment, Paul encourages the believers in verse 8. He says, and to give you who are troubled, that's the believers, rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Now, so there's going to be judgment for the unbeliever. There's going to be rewards, rest, to those who follow Jesus Christ. But when is this all going to happen? What is that event? Well, he says, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. The watershed event of all history is the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's what this passage is centering around. It's when all accounts will be settled. It's when the believers will realize, man, what a wise choice. It was all worth it. And the unbeliever will say, what a foolish mistake. It's the day that the prophet spoke of, the day of the Lord. Jesus spoke of it very often. He called it the kingdom of God, when the kingdom of God comes. So let's look at one of those passages. Hold your finger here and turn to Matthew chapter 13. So make a left. First book in the New Testament, the, the gospel of Matthew. And uh, Matthew chapter 13, by the way, is what we call the chapter of the kingdom parables. There are many kingdom parables here. And we're going to look at one of them, the kingdom of the harvest or of the tares, beginning in verse 24. It's self-explanatory. I'm essentially going to read it. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said, Do you want us to go and gather them up? He said, No, no. Lest while you gather up the tares, you would also uproot the wheat with them. No, let them grow together until the harvest. 
And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares, bind them in bundles and burn those weeds, but gather my wheat into my barn. Now, let's be clear about it. Jesus tells us what it means. Verse 36, Jesus sends the multitudes away, went into the house. The disciples came to him and asked, explain to us the parable of the tares in the field. He answered and said to them, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. Sowing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and the field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one, unbelievers. The enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age. The reapers are the angels. God is going to send out his angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, those who practice lawlessness, those who have rejected God, and will cast them into the furnace of fire, and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, you can go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We read here in verse 7, Jesus is going to be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. So that's when the believers are rewarded. That's when the judgment comes to those who reject Christ. And he will come, notice verse 8, he continues, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who don't know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's always interesting because people say, how could a God of love do that? I mean, God is love, isn't he? Yes, he is. That's one of his attributes. 1 John 4, 8, God is love. But God has a whole other bunch of attributes or qualities. Isaiah 6, 3 says that God is holy. Now listen, if there is holiness or perfection, you have to be opposite of sin. It can't, it has, holiness must deal with sin. So if God didn't deal with sin, listen to this, he wouldn't be holy and he wouldn't be loving, right? He wouldn't be loving. I, think of it this way, there was a doctor and he had tried to witness to a very moral woman. She denied her need for salvation, and she denied the reality of future judgment. She essentially said, this is what she told the doctor, God loves me so much he won't condemn me. I can't believe that God would make a place of hell, and I'm going to heaven. Not shortly after these discussions, she was diagnosed with cancer. Surgery, surgery was absolutely necessary for her to live. But the doctor came into the room, told her that, and said, but I wonder if I should really operate. I mean, I really love you too much. I don't want to cut into you. I don't want to cause any pain. And the lady, of course, said to the doctor, doctor, if you love me, you'll do everything possible to get this out of me. You won't let it remain in my body. And with that, the doctor went on to explain how sin is like a cancer. And if I really love you, I'll eradicate it. And so just as a physician, think about this, just as a physician cannot love health without hating disease, so God cannot be lovingly righteous without hating sin and eradicating it. So we're told here that Jesus is going to come in flaming fire. It sounds radical, but listen, every time God manifests himself throughout the scriptures, so often it's with fire. Up on the mountaintop receiving the Ten Commandments, there was fire on top. When Jesus appears to John in the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, John says his eyes were like fire, his feet like refined in a furnace. Why? Because it speaks of holiness, perfection. And here's the thing, when Jesus comes, that's what it's going to be like. And the believer is going to be refined through the fire. Why? Because all my sin was taken care of at the cross. It was all judged at the cross. I'll be purified and walk through that and into his presence, but not for the unbeliever. The ungodly, tells us in verse 9, will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So again, we're talking about judgment. It's pretty radical. We're told it's everlasting destruction. That word everlasting, it means perpetual. It means never-ending. Now, we like to talk about heaven, heaven as being forever, never-ending, but so is hell. Hell is a real place, listen, a place of perpetual destruction where neither the soul nor the body is annihilated. Now, I want you, that's very important you understand that. So think about this. We understand as Christians, we're going to receive a new body for heaven, fitted for heaven that will live on forever. And so it is for the unbeliever. They will receive a new body fitted for hell that can never be destroyed. Jesus said it in Mark 9, 45, or 44, it's a place where the worm never dies. What that's saying is when a person goes to hell, they, they can't ever die. They will continue to live. 
And Jesus taught of this. So I want you to look at that. Turn now to Luke chapter 16. So making a left again to Luke chapter 16. Jesus speaking of this very fact in a story. This is not a parable, which is kind of a, a story that's made up to give an illustration. This is a factual story. Verse 19 of Luke 16, there was a certain man who was clothed in purple and fine linen who fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar, his name was Lazarus. He was full of sores, he was laid at his gate and he desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. So you have a rich man, a beggar. The rich man isn't saved, he trusted in his riches. The beggar, Lazarus, trusted in the riches of God. He was redeemed. So it was that when the beggar died, he was carried by the angels, gathered by the angels to Abraham's bosom or paradise. The rich man also died and was buried, but where? Being in torments in Hades or hell. And this is what he did. He lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus there. You know, all the saints were there with him, all the former believers. And he cried and said, hey, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented, there's that term, in this flame. Now, what I want you to see is that this man is in hell, and yet he has all of his senses. He could see, right, because we're told he lifted up his eyes. He can speak because he addressed Father Abraham. He can feel because he asked, can water be put on my tongue? He has a memory because he, as we're going to move on, he, he talks about his lifetime on earth. He had emotions because he asked for mercy. But verse 25, Abraham said, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. Now he's comforted, you are tormented. This constant torment again. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Hebrews 9, 27 tells us it's accounted unto all men to die once. We're going to die one day. And then there's judgment. It's a fix from that moment on. You don't, you don't get the second chance thing. So he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, if, if I can't, I can't come over there. I pray that you'd send people to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. I don't want my family to come here. It's horrible. So at least they could have a better life. Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. There's the scriptures. The scriptures plainly tell you the truth, how to avoid hell. He said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, no, that's not enough. You need to go to them from the dead and they'll repent. But he said, hey, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither would they be persuaded the one rise from the dead. Hmm. One has risen from the dead, Jesus Christ. And yet people still today with all of the facts reject him. But the point is this. Hell is a place where neither body nor soul are annihilated but live forever. Now you go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. We're told it's a place of everlasting destruction. And notice this, from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. That's the tragedy of hell. Here's the greatest tragedy of hell. The greatest tragedy of hell is that we're apart from God. And God created us to have fellowship with him. That's what he wanted. Even in the garden, when man fell, God made a means so that they could have relationship. And then God, want, God went even further by sending his son on the cross to die for us so that we can have a union with him, have forgiveness of sins and fellowship with him. God has gone through great lengths to give us fellowship. But here's the other thing. God has also created us as free moral beings. You have a free choice. And, and that's what you want. You wouldn't want God to create you in such a way that you're just automatic robots. You're born, you automatically have to worship God. What love would that be? We wouldn't want it if someone automatically, they have, they're just programmed to love us. That's a program. That's a robot. Thanks for joining us here today on Larger Than Life as we go through the book of 2 Thessalonians. Do you have times when you start to doubt yourself or the promises of God? Then this book is for you. 
Read the words of Paul to the Thessalonian Christians and be encouraged to stand firm in your faith. Today's teaching from Pastor Ron Hint and others like it can be found on our mobile app, so go to ltlradio.org to find the link. We also like to draw your attention to our Larger Than Life podcast. We hope you'll take time to utilize these tools as you'll learn, grow, and discover more of Jesus. In case you've forgotten, that website again is ltlradio.org. Larger Than Life is a ministry of Calvary Houston and Pastor Ron Hint in Friendswood, Texas. Won't you come see us? We have Sunday morning services at 9 and 11 a.m. and every Wednesday at 7 p.m. We'd love to meet you. You can also connect with us through Facebook and X. If you have questions about what you heard today, we'd love to hear from you. Feel free to call us at 281-648-5800. Again, that number is 281-648-5800. Thanks for listening. We're so happy that you spent time with us today. Join us again next time as Pastor Ron has more to teach from the book of 2 Thessalonians right here on Larger Than Life.